Okay, so Parsha begins with opening with this classical opening, which we've seen before already. Parsha Toledot starts as follows. Ele Toledot, the Ele Toledot Yitzchak ben Abraham. Okay, very nice. Um, now we've seen this before. We've seen this before. We've seen the Parsha begin with the Ele Toledot Noach. And it's called Parsha Noach. And over here, we read the Parsha that says, Ve'ele toldot Yitzchak. And the question is, why? Why is Parsha Toledot called after the generations? And Parsha Noach is called the Parsha of Noach. Shouldn't this week's Parsha just be called Parsha Yitzchak? Why do we make this distinction between these two individuals? Ele toldot Noach. Noach ish sadik tamim haya bedorotav. He was a tzaddik in his generation, whereas Yitzchak ben Abraham, he was preparing for the generations. When someone is obsessing about his own reality, his own focus, his development, ish tzaddik tamim haya bedorotav, the parsha is called after him. But over here, we read specifically about Yitzchak setting up other generations this parsha has um, global ramifications, and you'll see exactly what I mean as we move forward. So let's keep going. Ela told Yitzchak, parsha is called after Yitzchak because he is worrying about his toldot. He's worrying about his legacy. He's worrying about what he can do to make the world a better, greater place. Not thinking about himself and his generation, but he's concerned and thinking about what he can do beyond his generation, beyond the world that he comes from. He's 40 years old, but he's 40 years old when he gets married to Rivka, but the Tuel Harami, and um, yeah, he Parsha continues. He prays to God. Because she was barren, she couldn't get pregnant. Yitzchak is praying for Rivka. And God answers him. She becomes pregnant. She's pregnant, she's expecting, and now she feels these, the baby's kicking and running around. So the Tomer, and she says, Im ken lama zanochi. What do I need this for? But tell her the at Hashem, she goes to find the uh, Eitzah. She went to inquire of God what's going on. Now, what was her problem? Like, babies are fluttering around all the time in utero. Why was Rivka so concerned? Rashi tells us that the reason why she was so concerned is simply because she had a uh, the situation where she would walk by a house of worship, a bed knesset, the house of Shem and Ever, and uh, she would feel this flutter. And then when she would pass by a house of Avodah Zarah, of idol worship, she would feel this little flutter. So she was concerned that she was raising a child that was confused. And what did she say? I don't want to raise a confused child. She's like, what's the whole point of having a kid who's confused. I'm supposed to be the mother of the generations that take on Yitzchak's philosophy, must be, what do I need this for? Let me find out what's going on. So she goes and she goes to ask Shem Ever. Yeah? She goes to ask Shem Ever. Shem is the son of Noach, and he was running the yeshiva at the time. He was the Rosh Yeshiva. And she comes and asks him what's going on, and he says, La goyim you have two nations in your belly. Okay, two nations, two people, are going to come from you. Two regimes are going to be separated from you. Right? Um, um, and the might shall pass from one regime to the other regime, which means that each one of these different groups of nations that are coming from her, this power will reside in one of them and move to the other, and from the other to the other, okay? Esav's descendants later are known as Edom, later the Greeks and the Romans. And Yaakov's descendants are later known as whom? B'nai Israel, Am Israel. So two nations are going to come from Rivka, division of power. Rashi, our best friend, that tells us, Shnei Lumim, going to come from you. Who are you talking about over here? We're talking about Antoninus and Rebbe. Antoninus and Rebbe were two individuals that lived about uh, almost 1,500 years later. Antoninus was a uh, general, um, and uh, Rebbe was the uh, Nasi at the time of the Jewish people. These are both leaders of two different nations. 
And that this, this relationship that we're talking about over here, the Shnei Goyim Yutnech, right? It's talking about these two people, Rashi, is later on. And the question is, why is Rashi telling me that? Like, aren't we talking right now about Yaakov and Esav? Why do you got to tell me about Antoninus and Rebbe? It makes no sense, right? Just tell me about the two people right now, that Yaakov and Esav are going to form two nations. Why are you telling me about a reality that's going to happen 1,500 years later? Who cares? Okay, we're going to come back to the answer. So, Vayetze HaRishon Admoni, the first one comes out all red. Kadet Se'ar, he's very, very hairy. Vikru Shemo Esav, he's called Esav. Why? Because he's complete. He's Shalem. Esav, Gematria is 376. The word Shalem is 376. Esav is born with every single gift you could possibly imagine. He's beautiful, he's handsome, he's charismatic, he's articulate, he's got a good memory, he's strong, he's fast. He's the guy that walks in the room and everyone pays attention to. He is impressive, but he got all those gifts and he did not have to work for them at all. He's complete. Esa Yaakov, what's he called? And uh, the uh, second son comes out and he's holding on to the heel of Esav. Symbolically, this, by the way, is, means that, that Esav Yaakov is no, is no not in the same league as Esav. Yaakov is like a loser relative to all of Esav's greatness, great qualities. He's the heel. He's the bottom of the foot. Yitzchak was married for 20 years before he had his two kids. He's 60 years old at this point. And you think you're old. Okay. And these two kids, they grew up. He was a man of the field. He understood how to entrap people with his words. And Yaakov is the Ishtam. He's a simple, complete person. He's the guy that likes to sit and learn. He's the guy that's always reading the books. Okay. So continue, it says, Ve'yahav Yitzchak et Esav. And Yitzchak loved Esav. Ki Tzayid Bapiv. He loved Yitzchak because their game was always in his mouth. He was always super witty, super smart. But Rivka, oh, it at Yaakov. But Rivka loved Yaakov. And now we have to figure out like this. What does this mean? Right? That uh, Yitzchak loved Esav and Yaakov was loved by Rivka. I mean, Yitzchak was a Navi. Surely he knew about uh, the challenges that Esav was going to bring to the world. Surely he was aware of the fact that his own son was involved in all kinds of horrible acts like murder, uh, raping, and idolatry. He should have known all this. Why is he the one loving Yitzchak? Why is Yitzchak loving Esav? Shouldn't he have been more aware of his own son? And what kind of a father is he at this point? I made a bracha earlier. Anyway, so um, let's try to figure this out together over here. You have a father who's a very smart man. He's got two kids, twins, same father, same mother. And one kid is, you know, like literally teetering uh, off the derech. He's like, you know, ready to leave his whole, his whole Judaism behind. And Yaakov is this great kid, and his father is not, he's not getting the love of his father. The question is why? What does Yitzchak see in Esav? that he loves him so much where he wants to even give, even give him the barachot. Okay, let's skip a little bit. So um, there's all these wells over here. I wanna to get to this other point over here. Okay. So now Esav tells, yeah, Yitzchak tells Esav, go get me some, uh, um, um, get me some food and I wanna give you a bracha, okay? So uh, he says, not a problem, Dad, I'll go get it. Okay, uh, instead, Rivka hears about the proposition that uh, he's going to go ahead and give the brachot to Esav, and she wants to stop this at all costs. So what does she do? She tells, I'm going to prepare everything for you. You're going to go in there, you're going to trick your dad to take the brachot from him. And the question is, how is he allowed to do this? Why is he doing this? Why is Rivka helping her son bamboozle her father? Is this the way of all mothers? to take their children and use them to trick their fathers. What is going on over here? How does this, how do we understand it? And then why, you know, we asked, why does Yitzchak want to give the brachot to Esav? Now Yitzchak wasn't dumb. He was a very smart man, right? 
Come closer so I can feel you, my son. Are you really Kiata Zebini Esav? And well, I wanna. Who are? Who is this guy that's standing here before me right now? He doesn't know. But he guessed Yaakov at Yitzchak. He came close. Yom Shai when he touches him. Yom I call call Yaakov. The sound of the sound the voice of this man is Yaakov. Vayadai mi day Esav. But the hands are the hands of Esav. But lo he kiro ki hayu yadav ki day Esav achiv sarotav ivarchehu. He did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like the hands of Esav, his brother. Why do I need to know that his hands were hairy? The how he tricked him? Who cares about this detail? The bottom line is, is that Yaakov convinces Yitzchak to give him the brachot. And we know that Yitzchak paused, he hesitated. And he said, whoa, 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 who is this guy standing in front of me? Because he doesn't make any sense. He's not Yaakov, he's not Esav. They have a little bit of the two. He asks again, Are you really my son Esav? He says, It's me. He drinks and he eats. Come closer again. This is the third time. He smells his clothing and he blesses him. Four times Yitzchak is checking to see who this guy is. The, the scent that I have this guy is the scent of this bracha, that, the, of, the, of the field that I'm going to bless, that God bless me with. He blesses him from the dews of the heaven. It's the fat of the land. All the bounty and the wine that the earth has. The nations will serve you and bow down to you. The, 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 your, your, your mother's sons are going to go ahead and bow themselves down to you. Those who curse you will be cursed and those who bless you will be blessed. This sounds like the bracha that Hashem gave to Abraham. These are the brachot now that Yitzchak is giving to uh, Yaakov, thinking that it's someone else. After Yitzchak finished blessing uh, Yaakov, as Yitzchak, uh, uh, as Yitzchak says goodbye, farewell to Yaakov, Yaakov goes out one side of the tent, and who comes in the other? And Esav, his brother, comes back from his hunt. He also brings from the Ta'amim these beautiful uh, delights for Yitzchak to eat. And now the drama is set up. Yitzchak just had a big meal. He gave these brachot to someone who we thought was like Esau, but not Esau, because we're not sure what he was thinking. And he comes into his dad. He says, Vayomer lo Yitzchak aviv. Miata. Vayomer ani ben chav ochay Esau. He walks and he says, dad, he said, Yitzchak says, who are you? He says, what do you mean, who am I? I'm your son, Yitzchak. You asked me to go, Esau, you asked me to go get you these, these delicious foods. Listen to these words. Ready? And Yitzchak trembled, a terrible trembling. Right? Ad me'od. He's terrified. Why the double ashon in the Pasuk? Right? It's like there's trembling. What does Rashi say? Rashi says. He saw the gates of hell open up beneath him. He saw the gates of hell open up beneath him. How does Yitzchak, this great patriarch, the guy who was ready to sacrifice himself for God, sit there and watch the gates of hell open up underneath him? What a terrifying sight. Can you imagine how terrifying he is? And now how do we understand that? So let me say it like this. There is no greater hell than realizing at the end of your life, you've made a mistake. There's no greater pain and suffering when you believe your whole life to be one way, when in reality it's something completely else. Yitzchak is going through pain. When Yitzchak, when Esav hears that his father gave the brachot away, Kishma Esav et divrei aviv, v'yitzak tzaka gdola umara ad ma'od. Esav was terrified, he was so upset, he was so, he was in pain. Please give me a bracha too. Okay, let's stop over here and let's try to talk about what just what we just read. Like you've heard the story so many times and let's try to put it into uh, proper context. So 
let's go back. Question number one, which we did not ask, is if a sav was born kitrot sets to uh, go out and worship about the zara, right? Where was his Where was his free will? And if Yaakov was born to go out and do, uh, you know, um, to learn every time he passed by a yeshiva, where was his free will? You have two kids, not even born yet, they're in Euro, and each one is running and asking to do something that seems contrary to the nature of things. Is this, do we believe in free will, or is everything predetermined? Okay, that's the question we have to answer for today's class, because that's the question on the title of today's class. So let's do it like this. Yitzchak understood that kids are different and each kid has different strengths. Esav's strength was power, articulate, strong, military, decisive. If you had to choose one of the two kids who are going to bring on the philosophy of Abraham and Yitzchak into the world, who would it be, Esav or Yitzchak? Are you going to choose this nerdy guy who's sitting and learning all day? Are you going to choose this gorgeous, gigantic, muscular man who is super impressive, right? To go ahead and be the spokesperson for your belief, your faith. Yitzchak sees power in a sab, a power that would convince the world of the beauty and the truth of the Jewish people. So he says, you know what? I recognize my son's not perfect. I recognize that my son does not have everything, but that's because he's too worried about gash, gashmiut. He's too worried about all the physical things in the world. I want some, he wants money and power. A guy like that needs to have it, and all he needs is the brachot themselves. And once he gets the brachot, he will have everything that he needs to live a life of blessing and bracha. And once I give this to him, once he gets the uh, bracha, you know, uh, he won't be worried about it anymore, and he will no longer involve himself in these horrible things. So comes in, uh, Yitzchak, go, I'm going to give you the brachot. Yaakov says like this. He recognized that Yitzchak wanted to create a partnership between him and Esav. Now, he didn't know that Esav checked out. He didn't realize how far gone Esav was. And Yaakov said, you know what? If it's my father's looking for this charismatic guy, a guy who will go ahead and trick and be convincing and be articulate and strong, I can be that too. I can evolve. Esav is shalem, he's complete, he's full, where Yaakov is the heel, he's always striving to become more. And because of that, he grows into the man that becomes the man of Yedei Yedei Esav, a kol kol Yaakov, the best of both worlds. You see, from Yitzchak's perspective, if I have these two brothers working together, they could conquer the world. Esav, the warrior, Esav, the politician, Esav, the businessman, but Yaakov, the Kohen, the, the Rebbe, the teacher. And with, with this partnership between these two boys, we could control the world. We can take everything over together. But Yitzchak did not know that Esav already checked out and he wasn't sure that Yaakov could adapt, but he did adapt, right? We know in next week's parasha that Leah was always crying. Why was Ene Leah Reka? Why was she? Why was her, why were her eyes soft? Chazal say that she was crying because she knew that that she was going to marry Esav. She knew she would marry Esav, and she was terrified that she married this guy who was a horrible human being. So she's crying and crying and crying. And we know that Rachel was destined to marry Yaakov. We know that. Now, how? How come, why is it that when ya it's Yaakov goes ahead to get married, he has to marry both of them? He marries both of them because he takes on the role of Esav. The Chachamim tell us there's supposed to always be 12 tribes, no matter what. Six of them from Esav and six of them from Yaakov. It was supposed to be a partnership, like Yisachar and Zvulan, one set of kids learning and the other set of kids working. That was the partnership. Just like Antoninus and Rebbe, like we said earlier, Rashi's telling me that, hey, you have this uh, partnership for a reason. The partnership is there. So that what? So that we can go ahead and bring these two worlds together. The world of the elite Roman army and the brilliance of the Jewish people. And together they could conquer and, and, and bring the world to a state of peace and harmony like the relationship of Antoninus and Rebbe. And this is why Rashi brings it down over there, because that's the goal 
of this relation between Esav and Yaakov, but Esav doesn't really buy into it. He checks out. So Yitzchak's genius is in using the strength and the power of Esav, but he, again, did not recognize how far gone he was. So how do we reconcile this question of determinism that these kids were born with a predisposition for, for bad and good? So I'm going to argue like this. When Esav, when he was in the utero, and Rivka would walk past a house of Abba Zara, he wasn't running to come out to worship it. He was coming out to destroy it. His job was to wipe out paganism and polytheism from the planet. And I'll prove to you that he actually succeeds in his mission. Who's responsible for destroying paganism? Who's responsible for destroying polytheism in Europe? It was Constantine. Constantine was a uh, part of the Roman Empire. The Romans ended up destroying Avodah Zarah in the world. The Romans are spiritual heirs to Esav. Imagine what the world would look like if the Romans would have adopted Judaism as their faith and not Christianity. That is the bracha that Esau was supposed to get. This partnership between these two powers of the might of Rome, of Edom, like Antoninus, and the genius, the brilliance, the inner beauty and depth, the spirituality of Yaakov. That was the world that Yitzchak was trying to create for his two sons, but one checked out. One checked out. So it wasn't that he was determined to go ahead and do bad. They were both trying to do good in their own unique way, but one ends up succumbing to this other aspect of himself, this darker side of himself. And he loses it the day that his grandfather passed away, because how can the world exist without a man as powerful and beautiful as his grandfather, Abraham? So what do we learn from the Parsha? We learn so many very deep things. Um, number one is that all of us are guilty of leaning on our natural traits like Esav. And when we do that, we become evil. We're supposed to be like Yaakov, someone who recognizes the, 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 the shortcomings that we have, the weaknesses that we have, and that the function of, um, of our time here is to work to develop ourselves to become something bigger and better. We need to become complete through the act of completion. It's not enough for us to go ahead and just be, lean on our natural talents. We need to work hard to become something bigger and better. And in that process, my friends, we could achieve greatness. It's not enough to do things on our own. You need to have partners. I can't do everything. I'm not going to be the, uh, the strong, charismatic guy. Maybe I'm the teacher, right? But we need partners. And therefore, when we think about our own lives, if this is Parashat Toledot, if this is a Parashat that teaches about our legacy, if this is a Parashat that teaches about how we can bring good into the world, you have to be humble enough to recognize you cannot do it alone. Esau believed that he could. And this is a tragic story of Esau. It's horrible. Chachamim say, Yisrael afabi shechata. That Esav is a Jew, even though he sinned, he's always part of the Jewish people. He's always part of the Jewish world, no matter what he does. But he lost himself because he was only thinking about himself. Yitzchak is worrying about the generations. Yaakov is worrying about the generations, which is why we're called Am Yisrael, because he represents someone who had all these things that were difficult in his life, all these shortcomings but he evolved beyond them. He didn't allow his circumstances to define them, but he chose to use his time to become something bigger and better. My bracha to each of you is that you recognize the beauty that you have inside of you, that uh, your, your limitations are a good thing, that when you come, overcome those limitations, that's how you achieve greatness, like Yaakov Avinu. You may be blessed with all the brachot in the world. Don't allow the gashmiyut or the lack of gashmiyut to get in the way of you becoming great. Uh, may you recognize that there's so much more for you to accomplish and all it requires a little bit of effort on your part to get there. You don't want to live a life like Yitzchak, where at the end of his life, where he had a terrible trembling, where he saw the gates of Ganom open up in front of him. You don't want to have regrets like that. You want to live a life knowing that you did exactly what you're supposed to be doing. In that way, you will be blessed. Shabbat Shalom, and Bezrat Hashem, we will see you all next week. Thank you so much for listening. Have a great day.